get started. Um, yeah, so welcome everybody who's uh, returning from the break. This uh, one hour session is going to be talking about some of the notebooks that were put in as a, as a new idea this year in the EarthCube meeting. Um, and if we go on to the next slide. So one question that people might be asking is why are we doing a notebooks panel? What's, what's really interesting about notebooks? What's, what's different about notebooks? And I think the, the reason for this is the fact that, um, that probably everybody that's here and involved in EarthCube would accept that software and data are increasingly essential in science. Um, and I would hope that people would also accept that they're not really captured in the publication record very well. And because of that, there is in general a need to better support um, how we actually deal with software and data, how we use them, how we understand them, how we preserve them, uh, how we reproduce work that involves them, um, and then how we actually just even reuse them. Um, notebooks are one of many different technologies that help um, address this. Um, notebooks can be runnable as well as uh, internally self-documented examples of tool and data usage. Um, and they can also help explain how scientific results were obtained by what were the, what were the steps, what's the software and data that were needed to do that. So notebooks um, additionally can increase the sustainability of software by making it more, more public, um, by helping share it, by increasing collaboration um, and decreasing non-productive competition. Um, so competition in a lot of cases is good. Right? It's, it's, bad if everybody's relying on one thing. It's good if people try different things and compare them. Um, but if there's something that works, there's no reason that we should have four or five people um, all working on the same thing. It would be better if we could um, use one thing that works well. And notebooks are a way of helping us do that. So the aim overall of this of the session and this notebook activity um, is to really leverage notebooks, uh, to treat them as, as citable, fairer workflows to help us accelerate the understanding and prediction of the Earth system. Next. Thanks. So um, in, in response to this idea, this year there was a call for notebooks. Um, uh, the notebooks could be uh, a, basically a primary, I was going to say first class, but uh, Kenton won't like that, so I won't say it, um, method for peer-reviewed submissions. Um, and these submitted notebooks then um, highlight a tool. This tool could be a software, it could be a service, it could be a library, a data set, or a standard. Um, and they explain and interactively demonstrate how that tool addresses a significant geoscience problem. Um, we want to use the ecosystem that's available, so submissions generally leverage either Docker or Binder or really a combination of those, um, as well as potentially some other services to encapsulate the tool and to put it basically in a, in a context where anybody can come and run it and, and try it out and, and learn from it. Um, what we asked for for submissions were abstracts and then URLs for a repository that contained the notebook in some way that could be run. And these then were peer reviewed by geoscience and cyber infrastructure reviewers um, and they were looking at uh, the impact of geoscience research and the overall usability of the notebook. Thanks. Uh, we had 21 notebooks that were submitted in response to the call. We had between two and three reviews per notebook. Um, this is something that I think is one of one of the, a number of things that we'll learn from is basically how to match the number of reviewers and the number of notebooks going forward. Um, but uh, but I think with two to three, we did a fairly decent job, and there were a number of people that were reviewers, and they're listed here. So um, so thank you very much to all the reviewers. Uh, we certainly couldn't have, have done this without you. Um, there were basically three of us as organizers who will be talking, as well as Lynn um, as an organizer also. Um, and we looked at the notebooks and looked at the reviews and not just the scores, but the comments and then tried to really understand what the reviewers were saying. Uh, we ended up deciding to accept 12 of the notebooks. Um, and that again was based on their impact in, in geoscience and their overall usability. And then we picked five of them particularly to highlight in this session. And we picked those based on the, on the scores, um, on the review comments, and on diversity. And diversity here being um, things like um, different disciplines, uh, different aspects of earth science, um, some things that were maybe more aimed at science, some things that were more aimed at cyber infrastructure, and then things like that. Okay, next, I think we'll turn it over to Kenton. 
Sure. So uh, as Dan was mentioning, this is uh, an early on trial for these kind of call for notebooks. And so basically we went into it knowing we would learn a lot and use that knowledge for the next time we do this. And as Mike mentioned earlier, we put in a proposal for AGU and I imagine we'll do it in next year's all hands meeting as well. Um, so just a quick, really quickly, a few of the highlights of this. Uh, basically one was runnability of the notebooks. That was critical, uh, especially in terms of the reviewing of these notebooks. Uh, notebooks that were not easy to run uh, were difficult to work with. Uh, and so that's probably a good thing that the reviewers, you know, experience that because that would have been something that would have been encountered uh, by anybody looking at those notebooks in the future as well. So we're discussing things like requiring binder. Uh, we don't want to impose though additional overheads in terms of submissions, but having those that did have uh, did use binder were much more usable. Uh, so that was convenient. Uh, another thing that we observed was uh, a need for formatting guidelines. So the notebooks all had different looks and feels and in terms of kind of collecting them as a sort of proceedings, they should ideally look similar for people looking through these things. So in the upcoming uh, calls for notebooks, we will uh, have uh, formatting guidelines for the notebooks themselves in terms of should have an abstract, how citations should look, should have a conclusion, things like that and the forms of the README that's included in the repositories themselves. So when people click on the repository, they get a consistent feel uh, to how those things look. Another major point uh, that I would emphasize was we saw two different styles of notebooks. One was focused on the tools, the infrastructure that we were, it was kind of the intent of the call, but there were others that were very much focused on the science themselves and just the tools were how they did their science. And I think we should acknowledge both of those. Those are both very important uh, in this kind of endeavor. And so maybe having two tracks in the future, one emphasizing science, one emphasizing the tools. Uh, and so I'll, I'll kind of close there for the sake of time, but what we're planning to do is kind of uh, bringing these together in terms of a paper that we might publish uh, later in the year, uh, maybe reaching out to some of those of you who were accepted as notebooks from to kind of capture your end of the experience as well, uh, and putting that out there for future folks who want to do a call for notebooks. Okay, so Dave? Um, <clears throat> I would just like to emphasize the, uh, the notion of um, notebooks um, becoming um, fair, uh, veto-worthy publications. I think there's been years of conversation about the, uh, the, uh, the importance of trying to elevate how uh, work in the, uh, whether it's in the creation of data sets or the creation of software, in uh, having that work fully recognized. And then for, from my perspective, that's really compounded by the notion of fair for science more generally defined. Because if, um, if I were to think of um, a fair as a vehicle, um, a notebook uh, could, could be at least one of the wheels uh, where the rubber hits the road. Um, I think that it exhibits all of those characteristics and I won't say more for reasons of time, but um, um, I see the EarthCube call for notebooks as a, an important milestone, but really in my, in, in my fondest hopes, it's just the first step toward elevating notebooks and data science to new prominence in the, in the world of, um, of scientific artifacts and recognition. Uh, the submissions were rich and excellent. And I want to emphasize that the bar we set for the 12 received was really pretty high, uh, especially considering that um, uh, you folks weren't given a whole lot of time to prepare these for submission. And in fact, um, it's uh, fair to say we asked the uh, uh, conference organizers, if there was any chance we could have more time, uh, because um, uh, we wanted to present more than five of them. So I would really encourage you uh, to take the time uh, to view and to run all of the 12 that were accepted and, um, and to use the Slack channel uh, to offer feedback and ask questions. And uh, we've tried to make these all easily accessible. There's a uh, there's a, a, a link to the uh, online uh, copies of these things. And as many of you know, uh, these are um, uh, open source um, um, artifacts that you can um, incorporate into your own work. You can look at them uh, to understand uh, a problem as deeply as you want to. And um, I'm hoping that there might be some opportunity later in the summer. We haven't figured out how to do that or even if we should try to do it for interacting with all of the authors to understand what they encountered by way of problems, what they think would be helpful in thinking about the, uh, this notion of notebooks as uh, uh, Vita worthy publications. Because as far as I know, this is kind of a, a, a first time effort and we recognize it as experimental. 
one possibility is that we might um, incorporate the, this kind of um, uh, discussion into the work of the technology and, um, and architecture, technology and architecture committee that I chair. So I would encourage you um, to, to attend some TAC meetings and to weigh in if you think that's a good idea. Finally, um, I'll just say uh, what I think are appropriate long-term intentions that are, uh, strike me as quite realistic. And that would be, uh, first of all, to have an AGU notebook session with a certain amount of earth cube prominence because we've, um, I think we're in, a, in, in, a, the, in the role of, of being a leader in this regard. The second thing would be uh, to establish a re relationship with um, one or more publishers, uh, perhaps an AGU publication or perhaps Elsevier's uh, Computers and Ge Geosciences Journal. Uh, but there are lots of opportunities that I think could carry us forward in this regard. And that's all I have for myself. Okay, so thank you. Um, the, the link that's in the middle of the slide um, is one that goes to all the notebooks. We are aware that this just has title, uh, kind of shorthand names, it doesn't have abstracts. Um, so the printed program, the PDF, um, has abstracts uh, for each of the notebooks. And we will also get a page onto the, um, the meeting site that has both abstracts and links. And with that, we should go on to the first notebook. Okay, is that uh, me? This is Scott, my first. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Lynn, are you uh, doing this part or am I doing this part in order? Um, yes, uh, Scott is first. Okay, okay. let's start it up. So can everyone see the, uh, the frame of the browser window here? We can see, we're having a little hard time hearing you, Scott. You're just a little soft. Yeah, I was, I was talking kind of soft as I was uh, talking uncertain about what you could see. Can you see the screen okay with the, the browser window and the, the uh, logo over here in the side? I'll minimize this. Yep, and yep. we see your whole screen. The whole screen, okay, good. So on the right is our, our BALTO logo. Um, it, BALTO is an acronym for Brokered Alignment of Long Tail Observations, and you can see that Balto, which is a famous dog from dog sledding fame, uh, does have a long tail. So he's a good uh, representative for our project. Um, now this, this notebook, um, I'm just gonna demo it right off my, on my computer here. Um, and I tried to organize it similar to a way I would organize a published paper since these were kind of treated that way. So I started off with a table of contents with links to jump to different sections and, um, and kind of just you know gave some background information i think one of the most important pieces of background information is that uh, this is using a data access protocol that's widely used on the internet called OpenDAP, which you may or may not have heard of but our team members on balto many of them are from the OpenDAP uh, organization and the, the standard they've created has become very widely used across uh, federal agencies especially uh, academics are using it but also most of the data you get from nasa servers or NOAA servers uh, has the option to be accessed by OpenDAP. So there's a lot of OpenDAP servers all over the world and there are tools for trying to get to those, but we thought it would be cool if we could create a Jupyter notebook with a GUI inside of it that would let you go and browse some data on an OpenDAP server uh, using an ma interactive map, if possible, and then uh, download the data, the, just the part that you wanted. So subset it using OpenDAP uh, tricks on the server, download the part you want and then uh, visualize it and analyze it. So this is just a demo of that capability. And the first thing here is, uh, and the code that's, that's actually powering this is in the same uh, folder, same repo as the notebook, but it's under the hood. So we're gonna import the Balto GUI as BG and then just fire it up. And so Balto.show GUI gives you this tabbed uh, GUI here. And the first thing we'll do, we're pointing to an OpenDAP URL directory. That's a test directory with lots of wide variety of different data sets to test with. And we're going to say go. And so it goes out and connects to that uh, server and it pulls down a list of all the files that it found on that server and shows them in a drop list like this. So I'm going to choose one that I'm using for this exercise. 
once I choose it, it's going to get the information from that server from the attribute data, like the, uh, the variables, and I can choose the different ones that are in the data set. And then each of them would have dimensions and a shape and units and uh, a list of attributes. And these are the attributes it found for sea surface temperature or SST. Um, tells me what the data type is, <clears throat> different things. And so now that I've chosen this, this particular data set, I can go to the spatial extent thing. And, and so for the, for the GUI, I'm using IPy widgets. For the interactive map, I'm using IPy leaflet. And so I can either zoom in like this with the zooming tools. And for this exercise, we're gonna go into Puerto Rico where it happened to be right now. Um, and these little tools on the side are actually kind of cool. It's, it's all coming from iPy leaflet, but I can actually do a full screen by clicking on that button and then escape back to the original. I can also open a measuring tool and measure things on this image. This is all being provided by iPy leaflet, which is a Pi version of leaflet, which some of you may be familiar with. But so, <clears throat> so uh, there's a lot of uh, sea surrounding uh, Puerto Rico and these islands. By the way, there's also other maps options that you can choose from here. So I can choose uh, S3 world map or something else to show as the background map, but I'll stick with this one for now. Um, so now that I've, I've subset it just by a little bit of zooming, I, I only care about data in this region. I'm gonna go over to the date range panel and, I'm, and I've, I see that this particular data set spans a start date of, of 1854 to 2008. And I don't really want to see all that, so I'm going to restrict this to starting from 1950. And I can put in a time if I want, and, and I can see the attributes that were associated with time for this data set. And it's giving time from a start date, so it's units are days since a certain date. So the GUI will automatically turn that days since into actual uh, times to, to work with. So now I've subsetted the spatial extent and the date range, and I chose my variable, so I'm ready to download some data. And if I click on the download button, it goes and gets it. And because of OpenDAP's capabilities to subset on the server, that little part of the, even though it was a world data set that I was work, uh, looking at, uh, it downloaded almost instantly because it's just that part that I care about. So this is, this part is just explaining those steps for someone doing the notebook. Now that it's been done, um, it's been loaded into the Balto object and I can get SST as a, as a youth from the user bar feature and I can run this cell and get some basic attributes uh, of that variable I just downloaded and um, it has seven and a, 704 time points and it's a four by eight array uh, at the scale that that data was. I can look for no data values if there are any. Turns out this little cell doesn't have any. Um, I can see the, the latitudes and longitudes and times that were rest I restricted to by my choices and then I can go down and I can say, well, I would like to know what sea surface temperature around Puerto Rico looks like. So I'm gonna pick a cell, one of those cells, the zero zero cell, the corner cell of that little rectangle and run this cell. And it's gonna plot up the sea surface temperatures from 1950 to 2008. And I can see these oscillations uh, happening, which are, we think are probably likely because of uh, annual variation, right? The sea gets hotter and colder in the winter and the summer. And to check that, I restrict down to a, a smaller window and use plus signs as the markers. And I can count that there are 12 markers between uh, trough to trough. And, uh, and I can also see from this plot up here uh, that there, arguably there's a, a, a trend upward in the sea surface temperature over this time period. It's even more dramatic if you show the entire um, period of record, which goes back to 1854. And then um, this next part is, these are using image display tools that are in the bottom part, uh, in the back that I provided in the back end uh, in something called Balto plot. But now I can show the sea surface temperatures as a color image. And um, just by running this one, and I can have total control over the stretch and the color scheme and the noted values and so forth. Uh, with this, there's a lot of stretch parameters if you wanted to enhance this, or if you want to look at a bigger area, you could it would be maybe look more interesting. And then this this that last part is trying to show some of the once you've got this piece of software between you and the server that has your data, and now that you can get the data, you can start adding additional capabilities like this variable name matching tool that we have for the scientific variables ontology. 
So in, if, you, if you noticed in those uh, data sets that we were browsing that were on the, the server, there was no standardization to the variable names. We didn't really look at that, but th there wasn't. And, uh, and so you might wonder, okay, uh, how do I know that SST and, and sea surface temperature, what would be a standard name for that? And would that enable me to find the same thing across all the data sets? And so we're working on a tool that will map, regardless of the abbreviation or the name, map to possible standardized names for the variable that you uh, have selected. And this is going out to a service on the web. It's just a wrapper around the service that uh, finds anything that is, seems to be related to sea surface temperature. And not just by substring searching, but also by an ontology of related concepts. So it's finding things that could be related. And uh, also there's a section looking at monthly mean, because this is monthly mean sea surface temperature. And so there's a few that focus on that operation of, of monthly mean. And uh, the last thing here is, um, you can, this gives you also low level access. So you can go look at the Python code, of course, and I think you could use this GUI uh, by copying the basic features of it or copying the map panel and the time panel, for instance, you could customize it to a lot of other situations and even other services that you might want to interact with on the web. So we, I tried to write this in a way that it's uh, easily extendable and very clear what's going on um, under the hood. But this shows you some of the- So, so Scott, I think you're, you're almost out of time, I believe. Okay, this is good. I'm essentially done. This, I just showed that I've included references, uh, links to all the different component technologies and papers. And another thing I think is important based on this usability thing that was raised is I, I thought it was important to make it very clear how to install this on your own computer. So it does run with binder, but it runs better if you just type this collection of commands to install it on your own system. And, uh, and I gave like a crash course tutorial on, on uh, using Conda environments, installing it in Jupyter Notebooks and Jupyter Lab. Like I'm using Jupyter Lab right now, which is even better than Jupyter Notebooks um, to show this. And, and that's it. So it's, that's all I wanted to show. Okay, thank you. Um, I think because we are probably a little bit uh, running over, um, if there is a question that somebody has, we could try to take maybe one question. Um, and maybe the next person can also start sharing if that uh, works. Yes. The next person should be Julius. Yeah. So any, any question, quick question for Scott? And we'll have a chance for questions okay. at the end too, right? If something comes up. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's, uh, so thanks, thanks again, Scott, and let's go ahead then to Julius next. Hey, yeah, uh, uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak and thanks for this, uh, uh, putting this, this great uh, conference together. I think this is quite a unique opportunity. Um, I'm a postdoc at, at Princeton University working with uh, Loa Vesplondi and I just want to acknowledge her uh, for letting me work on this on the side as part of some of my projects. Um, I'm just going to talk about two packages, uh, two Python packages that um, I've been working on and how to use them to actually work more efficiently with CMIP6 data. So first of all, since it's a quite broad audience, I thought I'd introduce really briefly what CMIP6 actually is. So that's sort of a, a lot of the basis of our current knowledge about the climate system and how that will evolve in the future is based on these climate model uh, coupled model intercomparison projects, which is CMIP stands for, and six is the, the latest iteration of that. And without going into too much detail, there's sort of certain protocols that you follow in terms of forcing by, by greenhouse gases, and then a bunch of uh, modeling centers run with these protocols and give all their different model results um, and basically put that on the, the CMIP archive. And that means you end up with a lot, a lot of data. Uh, you're talking a range of petabytes, I think, uh, for all of the data that's there. And each one of these model into comparison projects ends up with a lot of these uh, numerical model out outputs, which are usually gridded, as you can see on the right. And so a typical workflow would be to download that data, takes a hell of a lot of time if it's that much data, then usually people wrangle with sort of uh, uh, regridding and stuff. But the downloading of the data, basically, um, there's, there's sort of a, new initiative uh, by the Pangeo project, uh, where a lot of the CMIP archive was actually put on the Google Cloud Storage and is a public available data set. So you can compute on that without downloading anything, taking away, I think, one of the biggest 
hurdles to actually work with the data in the first place. I'm going to talk about the second step where uh, I think a pretty common thing is that people uh, regrid the data, especially ocean models are notorious for having these complicated grids. And I think we have a solution for working with these. Um, and the other thing is that was briefly mentioned by the previous speaker as well, sort of uh, the naming conventions differ, uh, longitude conventions differ. So there's a lot of these pre-processing that really kind of takes away from your time away and your focus away from the stuff you really want to do. You want to apply an analysis and in, in the context of a intercomparison project, you want to run it on each model and then look at the results and then sort of discover something new and reiterate that. And you don't want to spend all your time on, on uh, you know, the, the boring stuff ahead. <laughs> really quick, uh, this is sort of a, a typical curvilinear grid of an ocean model um, to avoid sort of a singularity at the North Pole. You have sort of a tripolar grid and you have these sort of a little bit skewed um, grid cells that you can kind of see indicated on the schematic on the right. Um, but internally, all these models usually work on logically rectangular grids. So they fold all of this up and then they have an n-dimensional grid for usually x dimension, y dimension, and z dimension, or density dimension at depth. Um, so that's where the tool XGCM comes in. XGCM was actually made for working with output of this data. So the models have sort of little, they have differences between them, but all of them use what is called a staggered um, Arakawa uh, grid. So you can see on the left here that basically um, the tracer point of your, of your model will, is located in the center. Those are sort of the little squares. And then velocity point and, and fluxes are usually located at the cell boundary. So they're shifted half a, uh, a, a grid index. And so in, in practice, if you want to reconstruct whatever the model did to the, the, the most accurate way, you would sort of try to take, uh, if you want to approximate a derivative here as, a, uh, as an example, you would take sort of these index, these three points, subtract them from these three points, and then divide them by a, a grid distance. Uh, and then you would end up with, a, with an uh, approx approximation of the derivative that is located at the, at the cell bounds. This is not that hard, really, actually. I was, when I first learned of this, it's like, it's, it's pretty easy, but it's a lot of bookkeeping. So it's really tedious to do this, especially if it's not just a 2D set. Um, and it's really error prone when you have to think about whether your index is on the left or the right of your, of your tracer cell. And that's where, where XGCM comes in. Basically, the idea is we start with an, with an X-Array data set that has different dimensions for both the, the grid center and the grid's uh, boundary, which you can see here is XC and XG. Um, and then what you do with, with XGCM is basically you create a grid object that has all that information in it. And afterwards, you don't worry about it anymore. Afterwards, you're, you're you know, the one with the, the uh, many indices and all the, uh, all the semicolons basically goes away and you can very, very nicely write grid.derivative, either of a trace or a velocity, and it will accurately sort of find the, the metrics that belong to it. So the distances that are appropriate and also shift it from one grid cell to the other, um, or these half shifts in between. Uh, we currently offer a, a variety of sort of more basic uh, operations like difference, interpolation, cumulative sum, minimum, and maximum, and then the ones that actually incorporate the, the cell metrics, which are sort of the, the weighted average uh, integrals, cumulative integrals, and the derivative I uh, just shown. So that's still, you know, the setup of this is still quite complicated and you need to know about the model. That's where, where CMIP6 pre-processing actually comes in. So this was born out of the uh, CMIP6 hackathon at Lamont Doherty uh, Observatory last year, uh, where sort of I got a first glimpse at working with the, the model data in the cloud and noticed that the first thing was the naming issue. So I wrote a, a little bit of a general uh, function to rename all of these data sets. Um, as you can see here really quickly, sort of the, the logical dimensions are just differently named. There's NLAT and LAN and there's XY and IY and what um, CMOS, uh, 6 processing at the very basic level does just rename it all consistently. Um, it also deals with units. Uh, some of them have different units, uh, consistent longitude coordinates. So it's a lot of sort of bookkeeping, small stuff that it takes care for you. But really recently, um, I've introduced um, sort of a, a little database that knows the sort of grid configuration of most of the models in the CMIP6 archive and creates those and those grid metrics uh, for you. And with that, you can actually make plots like these relatively easy. Uh, I, I'm not showing my notebook because it actually still takes a couple of minutes and, and this was just not gonna fit into a, a, an interactive demo in seven minutes. But so the, on the left, you see for many of the CMIP6 models, the sea surface temperature gradient magnitude. Um, and really, the part on the right is mostly actually plotting and just like selecting a surface layer. 
the part that you need to actually compute that gradient magnitude is highlighted here. So it's five lines. That's what I think XGCM uh, makes XGCM excellent. And in combination with Lucene 6 preprocessing makes this really nice. For each of the models, it is the same line. You don't need to put any if else statements in there if you have your, all your grid setups uh, done at the beginning. And so I think, I, I hope I can convince you and I, I encourage you to like really run that notebook and play around with it, but it just does take a, a couple of minutes because we're running through like, these are more than uh, 20 models over there. Um, and so sort of we've taken away that, or Pangeo has taken away that downloading data step. And I think with using XGCM and CMOOC 6 processing, we can at least minimize this step over here and really go to the stuff that we all like, which is uh, actually doing the science with all of this amazing data that is now uh, publicly available. Uh, with that, I would, uh, both of these projects um, uh, really encourage participation from the community. So if you have any questions, any suggestions, uh, please don't hesitate to either raise an issue on GitHub, contact me on, on Twitter or Slack or email. Um, I, I'm really curious how people uh, like this. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks very much. That was, uh, yeah, quite a lot, actually. Um, are there, if we have a, a question or, or two quickly, we could do that and uh, we could also have the next person start sharing. Uh, next person should be Lisa. Dan, I don't see any specific questions for Julius, but I would point folks to the Q&A. There are a lot of questions that are getting answered in real time over there and you can continue to ask them there. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's go on again in the interest of time. Um, so thanks, thanks again, Julius. Uh, Lisa. Hi, so um, I'm super excited about this. Can everybody hear me? I did unmute. Yes. Yes. Um, so I'm, I think this is a great idea. These, I got turned on to notebooks a few years ago, and, um, and I've been using them for everything, including teaching this last quarter online, which turned out to be really useful. Um, I, I, um, my, I chose a project called PMAGPI, which is an open source software package that serves the rock and paleomagnetic community that um, I've been working on for, well, it started as a Fortran program uh, set uh, 20, 30 years ago, I don't know. And uh, I translated it into Python starting in 2000 or so. And, um, and now it's developed, it's, it's matured into a set of software that has hundreds and hundreds of functions. And um, part of the problem with PMAG Pi is that it requires installation of Anaconda and packages on your own laptop. And uh, there's such a, a variety of different operating systems and everything. It just became a horrible mess trying to help people install it. So I've moved to a Jupyter Hub um, version of this, uh, which allows you to run the software and you don't have to install anything. So I'm just going to jump into it. The, the reason I chose it for EarthCube is because PMAGPI is a way for people like me, paleomagnetists and rock magnetists, to take data from the lab and put it into our MAGIC database, which is the Magnetics Information Consortium database, um, which is our version of a findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable archive. What makes it interoperable and reusable is the PMAGPI software. And so, um, so PMAGPI and MAGIC work together so PMAGPI can draw data from the MAGIC database and prepare data for uploading into the MAGIC database. So they, they work together. Uh, so I'm, this, the, in my, uh, this is my, the abstract that I submitted. In here, there's a brief, very brief introduction to a very complicated database and a very brief introduction to what PMAGPI is supposed to do. So if you click on this link, the Jupyter Hub earthref.org link, it takes you to um, this page. Uh, but if you're doing it and you've never been into Earthref before, you'll have to get a user account uh, using your ORCID. Um, and 
The reason for that is that this allows you to modify the notebooks, save the notebooks, upload your own data, and work with it as if it's on your own laptop, but it's um, stored on the EarthRef um, uh, computer system. So to get started, you click on this uh, setup thing, and, um, and this sets up your, uh, your user space so that you can use um, PMAGPI. Then once you've clicked these, I'm not gonna do it again because I just did it, um, you can then open um, the PMAGPI project, which is a drawn from a GitHub repository of PMAGPI. Um, and, uh, and so uh, I can start the notebook that is featured in this particular version. Oh, I wanted to show you first um, that there's also a class for that teaches Python for Earth Science students that I've uh, developed over the last three years. And I have to say, I just turned in my grades for the last time ever. <laughs> so, but this um, class will remain on Jupyter Hub, and anybody can teach themselves. Um, Python using this uh, class course. Um, so going to PMAGPI online, um, uh, the notebook that was uh, chosen for this particular uh, venue was, um, what it does is it, it tries to um, illustrates some of the aspects of PMAGPI. There's many more and they are demonstrated in um, a variety of notebooks. So there's an introduction notebook here somewhere and, um, and with links to calculations and plots and how, how PMAGPI works with magic. So there's a bunch more here, but um, I'm just gonna show you what I put in this particular notebook, uh, which, um, shows you how you can take data from the MAGIC database, either if you have a DOI for a contribution or um, what's a, a permanent uh, text ID. Either way works, so you can uh, import data from the MAGIC database, unpack it so you can use it, and then there's some uh, basic paleomagnetic plotting tools like plotting things on equal area uh, equal area projections, um, maps of our virtual poles. Maybe you know about those. It's the, never mind. It's a paleomagnetic uh, artifact, artifice for comparing directions from around the globe. Um, and so you can see in this particular data set, the, the reverse poles and the normal poles and that they plot near the, the spin axis. Um, and there's um, many other uh, things that paleomagnetists love to do, like make site maps. Here's a site map of where the data came from in that last example. It's a published paper, came out last year. And you can also um, take data from, from your laboratory and convert it into the magic format in which case you can use many more programs. Um, I seem to have an unstable internet, but never mind. Um, and you can plot them the way paleomagnetists love to do, for example, as a, a stratigraphic plot compared to the, the time scale, so you can date sediments that way, um, and or anisotropy data. And we've added a new thing where you can take um, not paleomagnetic data, but other results like oxygen isotopes or um, natural gamma radiation or whatever is also in a stratigraphic framework and plot it with your data and store it with the data in the MAGIC database. So one thing that I like is that you can get um, the International Geomagnetic Reference Field will predict directions anywhere around the globe for any time over the last 100 years or so, 110 years, 120 years now. So, um, and, uh, and so you can do th use that to predict directions and field strength 
as a function of time for given place. This is useful for archaeologists to date things or um, if you're going out for a hike and you want to know what your declination is uh, with respect to the North Pole of your magnetic compass, there's a lot of uses. And um, one thing that I, I think you're, you're almost out of time. Okay, I'll just jump to the end, which is this movie of the field strength for the last uh, 3,000 years using a model of Kathy Constables. Um, and you can make this in my notebook. Okay. My okay, thank you very much. Do we uh, do we have any questions for Lisa that we want to do uh, verbally quickly? We also have the Q and A, as was mentioned, uh, and then if Chris wants to, Chris or Christopher wants to start sharing, that would be good as well. I guess so, Lisa. Maybe just quickly, from um, given that you said that this is your uh, your last uh, class, um, how is this going to be kept up to date? Material rather than um, kind of going out of date over time. It's a, it's a, on the on our Earthref Jupiter Hub. So um, and it's also in GitHub. So uh, even if I died tomorrow, it would persist. Does that answer the question? Okay. In GitHub. Uh, I, I, I kind of was thinking more like who is, I guess I more was thinking like who is actually going to do the work, not not the system that it was going to stay uh, on. PMagPy, yeah. uh, there's about five or six of us that have uh, push uh, powers. And so um, there's the co-authors on this um, abstract are contributing actively developing PMagPy too. So uh, there's uh, um, Nick Swans and Heisel's an assistant prof at Berkeley, and, um, and he's been actively taking it on and introduced me to Jupyter Notebooks, in fact. And so um, I have now yeah. been um, developing a, a group of people who are interested in maintaining this. I'm well, not quitting, by the way. Just because I'm not going to teach anymore, <laughs> that gives me more time to work on this project. <laughs> Great. Okay. Uh, let's let's. So, thank you again. Uh, let's go on to the next notebook. Then. Hi. Thanks. Uh, this is Chris. Um, I'm going to be presenting this uh, notebook that. Uh, I'm pretty excited to show. <laughs> uh, so the aim of this notebook is to demonstrate an initial use case of the, the YT platform in 3D volume rendering of geophysical data. And specifically, I'm talking about seismic tomography in this notebook. Um, so I just have a couple of kind of intro slides before I show you a brief overview of the notebook. So the, the YT platform is an open source Python library that was built originally for visualization of 3D astrophysics data sets. And it can do a lot of nice plotting and analysis, including slicing and projections through 3D volumes, sampling along paths through volumes, probability distributions, particle plots, and uh, the focus of today's notebook, volume rendering. Um, in case you're not familiar, volume rendering is a type of uh, 3D visualization in which rays are projected through your 3D data set to a viewing point. And as those rays pass through the volume, they sample the nearby data points according to what's called the transfer function and to arrive at the final pixel coloration in your final rendering. So um, for example, the transfer function on the bottom left shows a, a normalized distribution of the data that's being plotted in black along with two Gaussians, red and blue, that are the transfer function. So as a ray passes by a value that is within these Gaussians, it'll pick up that value and, um, and integrate it along that ray path to the final view. And you, so you end up with some really detailed final renderings, like this is an example from, uh, from Turk et al. of a binary star system formation, um, showing the transfer function used over at the right-hand side. Um, and 
what we're doing in this notebook is applying this method to seismic data. So seismic tomography typically relies on 2D cross sections and slices through the 3D volumes. And I, I think the main reason for that is just the, the unwieldy nature of trying to do 3D visualizations. And so seismologists have gotten very used to being able to do the, the mental gymnastics of slicing 3D volumes and thinking about how they relate to each other. So the aim of the notebook is to make that a little bit easier. And right. so yeah, so I have a uh, local uh, Jupyter notebook running the, the notebook at present because it, it does take a little bit of a uh, power to run this notebook. So if you if you open up the binder and run it, it will run, but you'll have to give it a few minutes to do some of the renderings. Um, so just be forewarned. Right, okay, so let's just pop down to one of the volume renderings. So this is a 3D volume rendering of uh, a data set from the IRIS Earth Model Collaboration, um, which is a repository of 3D uh, velocity models from different studies. So this particular study is a study from James et al. 2011, which shows the uh, seismic shear wave uh, velocity anomalies in the Western United States. Um, and so those are the kind of the 3D cloudy structures that you see here, the, the blues and greens represent uh, places that are seismically fast compared to a 1D reference model. The uh, oranges and yellows are places that are seismically slow. And so seismologists to first order in, in the upper mantle will interpret these um, anomalies in terms of temperature perturbations that arise from mantle convection and plate tectonics. Um, and so uh, the notebook basically goes step by step how to build this, this 3D visualization. Um, and in addition to actually doing the rendering, you can add annotations on the sur surface of the earth because so much of our interpretation of mantle tomography depends on how it relates to the, the surface geologic features. And so you can actually, the, the package that I, that I developed to help with loading this NetCDF file into YT allows you to add arbitrary shapefile data onto the, the surface of your 3D rendering. Um, so yeah, the, the rest of the notebook, uh, yeah, it just kind of goes step by step. Um, section four is on how you actually load the data, how you initially set it up with YT in order to do the volume rendering, um, how to add annotations. Uh, one of the challenging aspects right now is, uh, so the, the IRIS net CDF files are generally in geosterical coordinates, so that's latitude, longitude, depth. Um, but right now the YT volume rendering is limited to Cartesian coordinates. So one of the things that, this extra YT Bell Model Viz package does, which is actually included within the, the GitHub um, notebook repository. Uh, and so it handles that interpolation from the, the spherical net CDF coordinates to the, the Cartesian coordinates needed to do the volume rendering. Um, so that is one nice feature. And then I'm gonna just pop down towards the end to kind of show you some of the, the power of for volume rendering. So, so this again is, is a, the transfer function for this particular volume rendering on the right, which is the normalized distribution and the two Gaussians and the resulting volume rendering you get out for that transfer function. And so what you see in the end depends entirely on what you, you as the user and scientist choose to highlight. And so you can shift these Gaussians around, you can change their peaks and widths, you can add more, you can change colors in order to pick out different features in your data. So if you actually load this notebook and uh, start playing with it, I, I would suggest focusing on the transfer function section and seeing what happens when you um, change the transfer functions around. And um, on the underside of YT, these transfer functions are ultimately just NumPy arrays. And so you can, you can customize transfer functions pretty easily. So uh, down lower in the section five, here's an example where the slow velocity anomalies are um, have a transfer function that varies linearly within a range and similarly in the positive anomalies and they're using separate color maps so that the differences pop out dramatically and you get the image that I started with. Um, and I'm about out of time, but uh, section six um, kind of just talks about how you actually adjust the view of the 3D rendering because that's one of the, probably one of the challenges of 3D rendering in general is just um, setting up your perspective in a meaningful way. And so it goes through a couple of different ways of doing that. Uh, there's a movie that you can play um, on your own later, because I'm not sure it'll work over Zoom, but 
yeah, that I think I will leave it there. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, any uh, questions? We have a minute or two. So we don't have a specific question for Christopher, but we do have a question in the chat about whether anyone who's presenting today is thinking about K through 12 educators and how they might use these tools. Dan, it's up to you if you want to answer that now or have, have the group answer later. Um, yeah, I mean, so if, I guess I would say if, if anybody that has spoken here is going to speak would want to answer that uh, or give an answer from their point of view quickly, that would be good. And then we'll, we'll go on to the next uh, notebook after that. Or we'll leave that as something that people can think about and we'll ask uh, Chris one direct question, which is uh, how much of a challenge was installing YT into a typical Jupyter notebook? Oh, YT, not bad. Um, yeah, it, just because it's running. So, so there's a couple <laughs> short answers. So in the actual notebook, um, I, I generally, when I'm running it, will clearly have a, have a Conda instance where I have YT already installed. But when you run it via Docker, you just, if you just put it in the setup file, setup.py file, um, has a install requires down here. When you launch the, um, the, the binder, it actually will make sure that all these dependencies are installed. So in that sense, it was very easy. Um, the only extra bit that I had, I had to think about was how to include this extra uh, supplemental YT package that isn't yet in the actual main YT repository. And in the end, I decided the safest thing to do was just to add it as a package within the, the repository rather than trying to link to the one that I am actively working on in um, my own GitHub. Okay, Thank, thanks very much. Thanks again. Um, let's see, I'll just mention that there are, there's a couple of questions for you in the Q&A, which you can answer at your leisure as we go on to the next uh, notebook. Thanks. So, so Joe. Great. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, well, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, and today I'm going to tell you about a package called Scikit Downscale and um, in the process, I'm going to tell you about some work we've been doing kind of underneath the Pangeo umbrella. Um, so Pangeo is this kind of community open source platform and ecosystem uh, for big data geoscience. Um, and Scikit Downscale is kind of one package inside of that ecosystem that we've been working on to, um, to, have, to kind of build out some open source functionality around uh, climate downscaling. So that's the topic of today's talk. Uh, just really briefly, um, just wanted to say who I was. I'm a scientist at NCAR, um, and I'm also the technology director at a new nonprofit, um, taking a, a year of year off at NCAR um, to, to do that. Um, my research kind of focuses on the kind of the intersection of uh, data science uh, and uh, data science and technology and climate and hydrology. Um, so I've, I, I helped kind of start the Pangeo project a few years ago, and I've been a kind of a long time contributor to a bunch of open source scientific Python projects like X-Ray and Dask, and and of course I get downscale. So uh, my contact info is uh, well, my social media info is there on the right. You can find me in many places. Um, the Pangeo project now has um, more more projects uh, funded projects than this, but there's two EarthCube projects that are related here that um, I've had the uh, privileged to be co-PIs on, on both of them. So that's the top and the bottom one. The first uh, Pangeo project was um, led by Ryan Abernathy and um, that project's coming to an end this summer. And then the Jupiter Meets Earth Grant, which was led by, uh, or is led by Fernando Perez is uh, just got kicked off this last year. It was one of the last round of funded projects. Um, and then I'm uh, helping lead a, a related NASA project. So on the um, Pangeo, uh, inside the Pangeo project, we have this kind of concept of a software ecosystem, which is really just a, um, a grouping of open source uh, scientific Python uh, software packages. So that's what we're looking at here. Uh, obviously, you'll see Python and Jupyter and NumPy and some familiar names. And as you go out, we kind of move further out in the onion, we see more domain specific uh, packages. Uh, we've largely focused within the, um, the, uh, the, um, the Pangeo project on uh, Jupyter, Dask, and X-Ray. 
Uh, we've uh, spent a fair bit of time working on a new data format called ZAR, so that's circled over there on the left. And today I'm going to show some connections between um, many of these and scikit-learn. So this is a, a the scikit downscale package uses scikit-learn quite extensively. So just to motivate what I'm doing here, um, there's uh, I, I want to kind of introduce the idea of climate downscaling to those of you that aren't uh, familiar. So um, as Julius presented in a talk in his uh, in his talk a few minutes ago, uh, there's climate models are used as a research tool, and they're also used um, for uh, for climate impacts and adaption studies. So these are studies that want to say something about how um, specific human systems perhaps or, or, or environmental systems might uh, be impacted by climate climate change and oftentimes those uh, those the types of models we use to simulate those systems are sensitive to the quality um, uh, the qualities of the uh, the input data so um, I'm showing on the left here a uh, I can't find my mouse but on, on the left there's a uh, the, there's a topography and precipitation. The top two, uh, the top two figures, those are uh, the top. The topography and precipitation that may be represented in the climate model. So Colorado is in the middle there. Uh, you kind of see a, a light brown area for the Rocky Mountains, but there's not a whole lot of detail. Um, and you also see that the precipitation is largely on the east side of the mountains. So this is indicative of kind of typical challenges with climate models and precipitation in mountainous areas. On the bottom, we have something that we'll just call truth. So we have some high resolution DEM um, at say one kilometer scale and then some high resolution precipitation product that shows, oh, look, it actually uh, precipitates more in the mountains than it does in the plains. Um, so this is something we know, but that the climate models often get wrong. And so um, downscaling is really the process of correcting those sorts of biases and adding uh, spatial resolution. These are important things for uh, a lot of downstream applications. On the right, I'm showing four uh, different uh, downscaling methods. The top right corner is just an interpolation, or right, so the field is quite smooth. And then there's there's three three other downscaling methods that try to do some statistical correction of the biases as well. So over the past, uh, say, two or three decades, there have been many downscaling methods uh, proposed and implemented. Uh, they get used for things like the National Climate Assessment. Uh, and, uh, and so there are, it, psychic downscale is not about purely coming up with a new downscaling method. It's more um, creating an open source package where we can collect um, existing methods. It's become really hard in, in recent years to do any sort of uh, side-by-side -side comparison. And so um, that's one of the main goals of Scikit Downscale is to add some scientific rigor to the field by um, allowing for easy comparison. So Scikit uh, Downscale itself is this uh, Scikit-Learn-like uh, API. So it has this fit and predict method that are uh, uh, just kind of, for, for a scientist that's familiar with, uh, with machine learning uh, APIs, fit and predict would be kind of a, a a jargon thing that they understand um, right away. Um, and it allows then for easy composition and or comparison of different models. So on the right, I'm showing a time series of, of temperature downscaled with 10 different methods. And th those all those methods use the same API. There's just different models under the hood. And then of course we use X-ray and DASC to support uh, scaling up the analysis from the point scale, like I showed in the first figure, to large climate grids. And um, and then, it, uh, it, of course, we support both um, point-wise and spatial and global downscaling methods. So uh, the package, or we put um, a notebook together. That's that's this. Um, so the, the demo notebook is um, part of this EarthCube collection. Um, it uses uh, CMIP, Pangeo's CMIP6 archive in Google Cloud to, to do some actual downscaling in a binder. So you can click on the binder link and run it. Um, and I, I should mention that I, I put this notebook together with Julia Kent, who's a research scientist at NCAR, um, or a software engineer, research scientist, software engineer at NCAR. Um, and so this notebook, this is my, my talk here is really just a promotion for you to go click that link and, and give it a whirl. Um, Scikit uh, Downscale is, you can see some documentation on it and read the docs and there's a GitHub repository. We just made a, a release today so you can install it with 
Pi Pi or, or Conda or whatever. So um, that's it. OK, thank you. Um, I think because we're kind of at the end of the time, we're actually even a minute over, um, I'm just going to try to end here, more or less. Um, there, the q and I think, will stay open through the next bit. So uh, if you have questions, please ask, or uh, Joe apparently has lots of ways you can contact him, or um, so that will work as well. Uh, I want to, um, so sorry, I didn't say, I'm, I'm, so I'm Dan Katz on behalf of myself and uh, Kenton and Dave. I um, want to thank everybody, thank all of the people who submitted notebooks, in particular the people that did these presentations here, uh, these five talks. This was great. I think this is a, a really interesting thing to, to learn from and to go forward with. And um, finally, just want to leave the last word for Christine. I just wanted to make a quick acknowledgement to Fernando, Fernando Perez, who we're honored to have as part of the EarthCube meeting today. The work that you did with um, IPython that led to Jupiter, and the work of you and your collaborators, made this uh, new type of, of conference presentation possible. And uh, we're just also thankful that you as a working scientist uh, spearheaded this whole movement because it's really added to both the geosciences and just uh, data work in general to science reproducibility. So uh, shout out to you. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, so thanks, thanks again, everybody. And I think we now have a almost half hour break and then we'll be back with the next session uh, poster panel.